my grandson, every evening when he walks in, he will say something about, Mama, how long are we going to live like this for? This fire is not the first fire. First one did not hit me. Second one did. Third one did. This fourth one actually destroyed us. It started with one shock and then it grew up. We never thought it will come, come down to us because we were watching it, you know, we thought, ah, it's far away. When these fire people comes, they will manage it. They came, but unfortunately, they could not handle it. People were screaming and running away with their stuff. It came down very, very fast. It makes me feel very scared and I'm still very upset about it. I am really down about the fire, I'm scared of it. Informal settlements are with us and they're here to stay. Our populations are growing worldwide. Um, the UN estimates by 2100 we're going to have about 11.2 billion people. And informal settlements may double easily, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. So whether we like it or not, the informal settlements are going to grow and the problems with them, fire being a big one, are going to grow as well. Fire can have massive ramifications, can have destabilizing ramifications for families, for a community in its entirety, for the individuals and the families directly uh, affected, it's often a life-changing event. And that, that is something that we have to think about. If you think of 3,000 deaths a year, more or less every year, uh, it's a huge cohort of the population that carries this trauma. The Red Cross uh, Child Memorial um, hospital is a very good center. It's an important hub for the treatment of children, in fact, across the country. Until recently, before the setting up of hospitals in Gauteng, it was the sole children's hospital in the country. And they have a very good burns unit that has been uh, working in the field for 20 or 30 years. It's young adult men and young children that are most likely to succumb to burn deaths primarily fire deaths, and we expect that the majority of these deaths would come from the informal settlements. Most fire deaths, in fact 70% of all fire deaths, occur during the sleeping hours, which will be at night. So between, the, between 10 p.m. at night and 5 a.m. in the morning with a peak at 1 a.m. So most people that are going to die in a fire situation will die during the sleeping hours. Informal settlements, entire communities, but I also flag the, the backyard shacks that, that uh, are housing a substantial portion of, of people in the Western Cape, people in Cape Town at the moment. Most deaths would come from those kind of communities or those kind of household structures. Uh, they would tend to be in low income communities, uh, if not informal settlements.
the, the primary drivers of fires in informal settlements are really three or four. It's the energy sources that these settlements tend to use. There is a dependence on fossil fuels, uh, to an extent on uh, wood fires, but primarily fossil fuels. The second is the spatial arrangement and the composition of such homes. There is a high percentage of flammable materials within such homes. These materials are, are used to make it uh, more livable, but they of course pose a fire risk. The third is the layout of the settlement. This is often uh, in very close proximity to the next dwelling. And so this is a risk, uh, especially of a fire spreading. The fourth is human behavior. Human behavior, human behavior is, is, is important, uh, both in terms of managing a home environment, ensuring that the environment is safer, and of course, in terms of the first response uh, to, to when an event occurs. Um, in terms of managing the home environment, ensuring that you don't have open flames close to anything flammable, that you store kerosene safely, that if you have children, you need to be especially mindful around cooking activities. Uh, if you have uh, water on the boil, or if you have a stove that is cooking, but is also being used to keep uh, uh, a space warm, you've got to be mindful of children. And then as adults, uh, uh, within those environments, we do carry certain responsibilities, ensuring that flames are contained, are extinguished, um, and, and there, there are proper measures in case an event takes place. Uh, you know, what is the point of exit? Is there something to put out a fire? It doesn't have to be a fire extinguisher, it can be a bucket of sand, and so on. Are children uh, considered? in terms of the plan to take, to take care of the family in the event of a fire. In an informal settlement, you have a lot of combustible material. You've got curtains, which, especially those cotton and nylon curtains, you have a, a few flames up against and they catch fire. People line their homes with cardboard to keep, try to keep uh, warmer in winter and cooler in summer. You've got timber boards. You have got um, plastics, I mean, especially if there's leaks, people line their home with plastics. And we add on all these combustible materials and it's kind of like a braai in the beginning where you have lots of little pieces of fuel, you get them going and then they ca all the big pieces catch fire afterwards. And it's the same thing in an informal settlement home. You've got all these highly combustible materials, they catch fire and then suddenly everything including the dense wood and furniture catches fire after. And you have this quick spread from one to another as all the combustible materials which lines the wall so are directly exposed to the flames from the adjacent uh, home and any holes in the walls the flames quickly find and then catch, um, catch hold of the cardboards, etc. And then you have 30 seconds, 60 seconds, maybe two minutes, and the whole home will be up in flames. You know, a burn event is a staggering event in a person's life. It's uh, the, the, the actual losses and the potential losses and the um, impact on an individual's life or a family's life can't be underestimated. This house is new because we got burned. It's 14 houses that time. The, the, the fire started in, my, in, my, in the back. It's the two houses in the back. Started in the middle of the night, 11 to 12 o'clock, I was crying. And then we came out. When you see that the fire is near to our house, then the alarm started to cry because the alarm was in, the, in my room. And then we started picking the babies to put it outside. And then the, everything what got burned is only fridge and the stands that we managed to take out in the beds. Everything was burned that time. Sometimes we lose our families in the fire. I'm very scared of fire. When the fire is going up, maybe you are not uh, have a chance to go out. Ne? You are burned. Then you are going to die. 
ne? And then I don't think he, I didn't have a, something like a fire on me, ne? But when I thought, when I think, ne? Maybe the people are dying with a, a fire, ne? It's not good because firstly they are crying inside the the house, ne? And then the house, you see, they are making fire like so and then until to die. It's not right. It's not a good thing. You see, I don't like a fire at all. No, I don't like. It. We had a request a few years back by the Premier Helen Zilla here at the uh, Provincial Disaster Management Centre to try and find a solution or solutions for the fire problem uh, in particular in the informal settlements. The whole smoke alarm project came about um, through interactions between the University, Western Cape Disaster Management. Disaster managers have been pushing this for another number of years and coincidentally, well, thankfully, um, we were also getting up and running with um, fire testing at that time. So we needed to collaborate with uh, other organizations like the Stellenbosch University, uh, the engineering department, uh, in particular with Dr. Richard Walls, to conduct some testing to determine which type of technology uh, could work in the informal settlement environment or an informal settlement type dwelling. So we constructed a number of different types of uh, dwellings uh, made of corrugated iron and we conducted tests at the Breda Valley Fire Department. And what we did is we carried out what's probably the world's largest informal settlement fire test. Twelve informal settlement dwellings or shacks were built and burnt down with about five tons of wood inside. They were lined with cardboard and they were set out. It's, it's actually happening the last one or two about to burn down and we've been measuring temperatures and heat fluxes and flows and various other things so that from this we can get data on how fire spread and how to stop it in the future. When it gets to this stage it's too late for the fire brigade. There's, there's not much they can do. So we want to stop it before it gets here and one of the best ways is testing shows just smoke alarms and what happened is in almost a, a very similar dwelling we just tested smoke and fire and, and different types of fires to see how do smoke alarms and different types of detectors activate. This which has ultimately led to this, but this, this work feeds into it, say what, what detectors do we need, what are we trying to detect, and how, how sensitive do they need to be in those sorts of things so people can get out and put out the flames before it becomes this, because at this stage when you have from a small fire to full room involvement can be a minute. So yeah, the aim is to avoid this through early warning. As a result of that full-scale testing, uh, we identified a uh, photoelectric device um, this one in particular that uh, performed very well under those tests. So we then decided to um, have a full-scale a full test in a, an entire community. And working with uh, uh, Patricia Swech from the Stellenbosch University and Radar, um, we identified uh, an, inform an informal settlement that had a high risk for fire. So it had a, a history of fires that had occurred in the past. Um, that informal settlement was the Wallace Dean TRA. One needs to really understand the background to the area in which you're working and the community dynamics and the everyday lived experiences of people. You also need to get the buy-in from the community. You can't impose a project on people. They have to be accepting of it. And for them to be accepting of it, they need to understand what it's about. And to help them understand what it's about, you include them in the project. So you have this collaboration so for me, any project that I do has to be a collaboration. And just to understand the dynamics, you need to do that research. So it, although it's an intervention, it's also an opportunity for research. They went from door to door uh, to every uh, dwelling in the Wallace Dean TRA. 
uh, with the community's with the community leader support and, and his committee and they uh, conducted a, a pre-survey as well as a post-survey after the installation. We also used people within the community, um, youth, uh, young people um, that were unemployed at the time. We provided them with a stipend um, through the funding that was received from Santam and uh, we trained them to install these devices. This is the bottom part of the smoke alarm and this is a smoke alarm and this is a light. Uh, we taught our teams how to install it. It's, it's quick and easy. We just put two screws on and slide the bottom part. Test. It's on. The Wallace Dean TRA was because of their exposure, I think, to, to fire in the past and the, their community leader, Temba, they were very supportive of, of getting involved and looking at a solution to the fire problem in their community. Since we've got the smoke alarms now, it's better than before. In the fire that was here, in five years back, there were two people died in the fire. So. That was scary and that was my first time seeing a, a burned body. So now I'll say now, I'm feeling more safer even in my house. If you cook, you forgot your, 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 your cook and then it started to like burn, the alarm is telling you there's something wrong. The neighbors had the alarm and quickly they tried to pull him out but they couldn't uh, save the house. I, I just hear the, this small alarm, din, din, and I ran to that house. So the only one house burned down. It could have been more, or even that guy could have could have died in the in the house. If the alarm they are not there last year, the same November, you oh my God. So because of the, of the smoke alarm, it saved that guy's life. The alarms are helping us. They are helping us. This this alarm is very good. There was about eight different um, fire situations that we evaluated that uh, would have been life threatening um, if this smoke alarm didn't activate. These ones come with a 10-year lithium battery. It cost us about 160 rand each, 150 rand each uh, initially. So that's uh, about 15 rand a year for 10 years of protection. So it was a very cost-effective solution. In fact, a lot of research indicates that smoke alarms um, are the most cost-effective solution at uh, reducing fire deaths in domestic properties. The problem with our settlements, they are so dense and there are so many of them and we are under-resourced. We've got to spend the money rather on detection to avert these large disasters and the continual smaller ones. We know that uh, lives were saved in the Wallace Dean pilot and that uh, this is the most appropriate uh, technology to use. Very rewarding project because we can see the difference it makes, our, our early detection Early warning enables the, the, the inhabitants of a, a dwelling to respond timelessly to vacate that area of danger because of the early, early warning system. So it's very rewarding for us to be part of that. Having a, a working relationship between government, universities, or, or any research group, communities, is absolutely pivotal. As a government department, um, there's no ways that we can deal with this situation alone. It's about partnerships. Uh, communities have got a vital role to play uh, with respect to uh, uh, either bringing their labor skills, uh, volunteers out of the community, government uh, to hold the end with organized business, uh, because by pooling resources, there's so much more we can achieve. So that tripartite be between the communities, government and organized business, it's key for uh, uh, even if we want to achieve uh, the, the objective of the NDP, and that partnership is vital for us to take our country forward. I would like to say to the community leaders all around, please work with the government, the NGOs, whoever is there, the city of Cape Town, whoever is there to help, do that for the community. Don't do it for yourself, to help our people. Conversations, formal partnerships uh, between communities, decision makers, researchers too uh, are important.
The time has come. The president has issued that call to Mamina, meaning send me. So it is that call, that, that a, a, a rallying call, I think, more uh, we as corporates can, can, can begin to answer to, to, to really make a difference, because we can make a difference. In fact, during the time of this project, there were many other fire incidents that occurred uh, throughout the Western Cape, in the city of Cape Town, and even in the surrounding communities to the Wallace Dean TRA, where there were deaths that, that occurred, but obviously there were no smoke alarms that were installed. Twelve months after this program, after the installation of these smoke alarms, there has been zero deaths. There have been eight potentially life-threatening fires, and not a single death has occurred in the Wallace Dean TRA. And the fire was the fire that comes out of the dragon. I will never forget this one. Never in my whole life. Thank you.